Welcome. My name is Dan Carey. I'm the Communications Coordinator at Plastic Pollution Coalition. Thank you so much for joining our October webinar, A Poison Like No Other, How Microplastics Corrupted Our Planet and Our Bodies. Plastic Pollution Coalition is a nonprofit communications advocacy organization that collaborates with an expansive global alliance of organizations, businesses, and individuals to create a more just, equitable, and regenerative world free of plastic pollution and its toxic impacts. So to get started today, we have three poll questions to get a sense of who is joining us. And we'll just go to our first poll question right now. First one is, where are you joining us from today? All right, great. Thank you so much for joining. Looks like an overwhelming majority from North America and then from Europe, Central and South America, the Caribbean, Australia, New Zealand, Pacific Islands, Oceania. Awesome. And we have Asia and Africa represented here too. That's great. All right. Poll question number two. What best describes the sector in which you work? Okay. Wow. This is a pretty diverse crowd. We've got nonprofit NGO, education, corporate business, some in media and film. Welcome and some in research as well, and some in government and policy. Awesome, thank you so much. And our final poll question, how familiar are you with microplastics? Somewhat familiar for most of you, that is awesome. We're gonna make you very familiar by the end of today's webinar. All right, thank you so much for participating in our poll questions. So today we're gonna to be hearing from Matt Simon, a science journalist at Wired Magazine and author of the new book from which today's webinar gets its title, a Poison Like No Other, How Microplastics Corrupted Our Planet and Our Bodies. Dr. Danny Allen, a Mary Curie Global Research Fellow at the University of Birmingham in the UK and the University of Canterbury in New Zealand, and a co-founder of Plastic Pollution News, and Dr. Steve Allen, a Research Fellow at the Ocean Frontier Institute and co-founder of Plastic Pollution News. And moderating today's discussion, it's my honor to introduce Asher J, founder and CEO of Hinocene. Asher, welcome. It's such a pleasure oh, to be here. And uh, welcome to my panelists. What a wonderful day to get together and talk about something that affects all of us, whether we realize it or not. So I wanted to kick off the conversation with Matt and set the stage for literally the cover of your book and how it affects when you look upon just the image, which shows something that we all consume out of, a container, a plastic bottle, kind of pilfering due to whatever reasons, which could be exposure to elements, exposure to handling. And I'm sure you'll touch upon all of that. But the notion of something that is whole breaking into smaller parts and then those parts coming to be omnipresent in our world and subsequently ending up in our own bodies, affecting our health, our well-being, as well as that of the planet. So it would be lovely to hear your perspectives on how you would qualify microplastics, nanoplastics, what the differences are, and also how it really affects our well-being on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, I'll start and then pass it to the Allens um, to, to talk about maybe the scientific definition. But um, I have been reporting over the past couple of years about microplastic pollution studies as they've been trickling out. Um, a lot of you out there might have noticed that in, in recent years, there have been much more of these studies on, on microplastics, finding them essentially everywhere in the environment and increasingly in the human body. And it's... Um, I guess it's, it's intuitive to a certain degree that a bottle or bag out in the ocean is going to break down over time. Um, as tough as plastic is, it will break into smaller pieces, but never quite disappear. You're just deconstructing it into this galaxy of microplastics and nanoplastics. So the, the idea of the book here was to really go through the state of the science, um, especially in recent years, as more of these studies are coming out. Um, where scientists like the Allens are finding these things in the environment, um, and then the implications for both ecosystems and for human health. And I'll pass it to the Allens with that. Uh, thank you. Um, yep, so, yeah, we're um, researchers in multiple different universities around the world and have been doing plastic pollution for a wee while now. Um, and, yeah, as Matt says, uh, the microplastic um, and nanoplastics never actually disappear. So all of the plastic that you use in the world slowly gets smaller and smaller over time. So the theory that plastic is a, um, a product that lasts forever is accurate. However, um, it doesn't last forever in its full, large, original form. It does break down over time. And those tiny particles are the things that we look at with regards to ecosystem and human health and where the, the cause of the concern um, happens. 
Yeah, part of the problem is we don't know what each piece of plastic was exposed to. So what starts out as a plastic bottle, if you leave it in the sun, it's going to degrade quite quickly into smaller particles. But if it gets buried in the sand, it could be there for another 1,000 years. We don't really know yet. We're guessing because nobody's tried it for 1,000 years yet. So. And when it comes upon all of the contexts in which we don't encounter it tangibly, right, because at a point of it being expressed as a microplastic, how visible is it? Or am I thinking of something that is not actually visible to the naked eye? Well, the definition of microplastic starts at five millimetres, which is, uh, as Matt says in his book, about the size of a, a pencil eraser. So if you want to bring up the size slide that we've got, um, it might help kind of just give you a visualisation of, of what these things are. So um, the larger size of microplastic you can see. So the things that are arbitrarily called microplastics that are five millimetres. So if you think of a peanut, it's about two uh, um, centimetres in size when we go down from uh, the macroplastic down to the microplastic, which is about five millimetres. We can see things that are like grains of sand, grains of salt, the width of a hair. Um, that's still quite large as far as microplastic is concerned. Yeah, we and consider the red blood cell being, it's actually close to eight microns. Uh, the plastics that we look for in the atmosphere and, uh, and people are finding in food and water and in human bodies is in the region of one to two microns. So an eighth the size of a red blood cell. So it can pass through a cell wall where a red blood cell won't. Yeah. So we're breathing stuff that's sort of um, 10 microns and smaller. That's the stuff that you, you can quite easily breathe in, uh, gets into the bottom of your lungs. And most of the time the big stuff will uh, either breathe or cough back out so it comes out in the mucus. It, it's identified as a particle that's quite large and something that the body repels. But the smaller particles, so what we call respiratable, so things that are PM 2.5 classically as far as um, atmospheric particles go, um, these are things that are smaller than uh, two and a half microns, uh, smaller than the size of your blood cell. So we're talking about things that are um, smaller than the dust and the smoke. Uh, well, no, it's smaller than the dust particles, but not smaller than the smoke particles that you can see in the atmosphere. So you can't, you can't actually see these particles. They just um, get breathed in or ingested in the food that you're eating and things like that um, and can pass through uh, mucous membranes. So the mucous membranes that are in your gut, the mucous membranes that are in your lungs, things like that. So they're teeny, tiny, tiny. And yeah, you, you can't see them. They're just magically everywhere. <laughs> Now, how do they bioaccumulate and biomagnify in organisms and how do they move through both our own circulatory system as well as that of the planet? And what, what do you see as the ramifications of that? Matt, do you want to take this first? Yeah, I think um, one of the interesting <laughs> things to consider here, and, and it was just mentioned, is that um, these, these particles are traveling through the environment quite fast distances, as the Allens have modeled hundreds of thousands of miles through the atmosphere. But you can also think of these just tremendous numbers of microplastics floating through the ocean. And when they do that, they accumulate this really unique and fascinating, I call it a plastosphere. Um, it's just a collection of microbes, this super diverse, super interesting, because there's this brand new substrate that, that in, unfortunately, the environment has never before encountered. So um, we could have these particles blowing out of the sea back onto land that have accumulated um, all of these different critters. Uh, they have found a lot of antibiotic resistant bacteria on them as well. Um, so that's in addition to all of the chemicals, the component chemicals of, of plastic, uh, at least 10,000 of them, many of which are known to be toxic. So we have to consider not only the particles themselves, what they're doing going through, um, as you say here, the mucous membranes um, through individual cells, but what do they bring with them when they do that, I think is a, is a big concern here. Would so you like to touch on that it, it, quickly in regards to what adheres to the microplastics and regards to organic pollutants and like persistent organic pollutants? But yeah, plastics, because of their surface charge and their, their chemistry, they actually adsorb things from the environment, everything they pass through. So legacy chemicals like DDT and uh, PCBs that we think have gone away and gone into riverbeds and that's done, the plastic can actually pick them back up and absorb them and bring them to us, which means that these tiny little plastic particles that we breathe or eat and are passing into our circulatory systems 
um, can actually be carrying legacy chemicals, which we know are highly toxic. They can carry mercury, lead, uh, cadmium, antimony. If you can name it, it's probably stuck to it. Yeah. So the tiny particles, they're a little bit like Velcro. Um, so we know that if you're thinking of like riverbeds and if anybody here does uh, hydrology or sedimentology or, or any of those sorts of sciences, they know that um, things like kale and clay are kind of sticky. Um, and because they're tiny, they're really good at picking up the things in the environment as it passes through. Um, plastic is like a whole order of magnitude better at doing this. So everything sticks to plastic better than it sticks to all of the other materials that are out there in the environment. So that it will preferentially attach to the outside of this and move. And if you um, have a look at some of the um, pictures that we've got of microplastics on some of our slides, you'll see that as the, um, so if you go to the next slide and the one after it maybe, you can see that as the, the particles degrade, they've actually got a surface that's got cracks, it's got like little uh, oxygen pockets in it and things, and material that's in the environment sticks in all of these crevices and these uneven surfaces really well. So you, uh, when it gets oxygenated, when it gets starting to degrade on the surface of these, um, all of the material that's in the environment kind of, folds into these tiny little pockets and gets transferred um, without being released quite easily until it gets into certain environments. Things like uh, when it gets somewhere that's um, appropriately warm, when it gets somewhere that's quite acidic, when it gets somewhere that's got a lot of like uh, oily residue in the environment, um, then the release of these chemicals um, and these like um, Trojan horse particles uh, can get released alongside the things that are actually in the plastic being released as well. And when you're talking about um, specific mechanisms through which we have resources delivered to us, sometimes it can be traveling through plastic, right? It's just part of infrastructure. So how would you tackle, when we tell people to use less plastic, whether it's in consumer packaging, whether it's in infrastructure, whether it's in um, just industrial application of the material, it's ubiquitous because it's convenient, it's malleable, it has many properties that makes it a viable material to work with for so many sectors. So how can we persuade industries to use the material less so that we're reducing it as a source level as opposed to keep talking about it at a symptom level? Okay, we've been told a lot of lies about plastic. There's a lot of mistruths and half-truths that the industry has been working on Pretty trying much. to convince us. Yep. Things like um, cars are, are lighter and they save fuel because of plastic. Well, that's just not true. If you look at a Mini Cooper from 1976, it weighed 700 kilos or about 1,500 pounds and got 38 miles of gallon. The new one weighs 1,400 kilos or 3,000 pounds and gets 30 miles of gallon. It's bigger, it's heavier, and it uses more fuel. So that's a complete lie. And the plastic industry would have us believe that coating plastic all over our fruit and vegetable makes it last longer. And it looks like it does. But... They also mean that they can transport them further. So you wind up with more road miles on your food. And when you get it home, it's dead in a day in your fridge. So we haven't actually improved anything. All we've done is it means that the supermarket doesn't have so much spoilage. They pass it on to us and blame us for the spoilage, that we're throwing away food unnecessarily. So we haven't actually gained anything substantial by the use of plastic. It's just been forced upon us. As, as far as, like, Joe Bloggs' um, environment is concerned, there is a place for plastic in things like the medical world where it's, a, it's created a lot of the medical advances and we couldn't be doing some of the medical um, procedures uh, and life-saving sort of activities that we do in the medical world without plastic. Having said that, um, there are studies identifying that some of the plastic tubing you've got in the IVs are actually transporting um, chemicals that are inside that plastic into especially um, babies like infants that are at uh, potentially toxic levels. So there are places where you should and shouldn't use plastic in the medical world, but it's understandable that there is a place for plastic potentially. It's just not in daily use the way that we currently use it. We don't value plastic. Plastics considered one of those consumer items that um, it's cheap and easy to make and it's got absolutely no value in our lives at all. So it's a throwaway thing. You, you buy it, it costs you almost nothing and it costs you almost nothing to throw it away. But the reality is that it actually costs the environment a huge amount. It costs the recyclers or the waste managers an awful, an awful lot. And we don't, we don't put that um, 
financial or environmental cost into our consideration of how we use this at all. So one of the key things that we need to do is we need to change our view on what the value of plastic is because at the moment it's completely inaccurate. Is that... Like, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead oh, I was just, just going to say, yeah, those, those externalities just aren't built into and especially when you consider the way that the developed world now handles plastic waste. We recycle very little of it ship a bunch of it across oceans, which comes with its own emissions um, to be not recycled somewhere else and most likely burned. Um, and then I'll just add that, you know, microplastics are a fundamentally different beast than macroplastic, like, like bags and bottles, because there's so many sources of this stuff. So like car tires and clothing microfibers and cigarette butts, we throw them away by their trillions into the environment. They break down, down into microfibers as well. So yes, we need to like massively reduce the amount of plastic, but we also need to come to terms with the fact that the plastic industry has surrounded us with this material in sneaky ways that we just didn't see. And, and I don't think a lot of people realize that their clothes are, are made out of plastic more often than not these days. So I think that's that's the uh, what I try to do in the book is tell people, listen, it's all, all around us. It's we're literally wrapped in it. Uh, it's not just about you know recycling and and re reusing and just using less plastic in general. It's also about tackling the many different ways that microplastics can actually escape into the environment. Yeah, I mean, if you if you sit uh, if you look around where you're sitting right now, so if, like if, if everybody that's on this call, anybody that ever listens to it in the future, just sits and looks where they are. What you're wearing is probably you've got at least one item of clothing that's plastic. If nothing else, your underwear is probably made out of plastic because it's quite difficult to, to not have that. Your paint on the walls that you have will have some level of plastic in it. Your carpet probably does. If you don't have carpet, then you will have um, varnished or oiled wood. And the varnish has got a polyurethane in it that is plastic. There'll be coating on whatever table and equipment. You're on a computer. The computer's made out of plastic. Um, it's, it is literally everywhere. If you're wearing makeup, there is a high potential for you to have plastic in that. And if not, then it's going to be in the containers that are, con that are holding it or the containers that uh, you're using to um, store the, the liquid or whatever it is that you use to take your makeup off with because it's got uh, chemicals in it. So it is literally absolutely surrounding you. And all of the plastic that you see surrounding you is non-food grade Right, so everything that's around us, including things like the paint that's in that you use to mark the roads, that's all got plastic content in it as well. Um, that's not uh, monitored or designed for humans to eat, and yet we are inhaling and ingesting all of these particles as they degrade. So, um, a lot of the concern, especially some of the things that like Matt's identifying in the book, is that we don't know all of the chemicals in the plastic that we're inhaling and ingesting because they're non-food grade, um, which means we also don't have a control over those chemicals at all. Um, so it's not just about making like the single use plastics and the food grade plastics that we choose to put in our lives or, you know, have some level of choice over. It's about everything else as well. Touch, touching on both of the statements made thus far, and, and perhaps you can shed additional light before you start on your next thought, which is we, you all touched on externalities and external, externalized costs, particularly financial, um, but also looking at it from health costs, right? Like what? how many people are affected by plastic in the world and who is responsible? Like who's going to take on that accountability to well-being? of those who have been affected and what are the adverse effects of continuous exposure? Are there certain demographics that are more likely to have higher exposure rates? Um, and where could we have access to this kind of data to know sort of the health costs of plastic and why it's essential for us to wean off of it? Yeah, that's yeah a, I mean, that's good. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> so that's a loaded question. Um, who's going to pay for it? Well, it'll be us. It won't be industry. <laughs> I can guarantee you that. I mean, I used to think that maybe industry had access to different data than we do, that somehow they knew that they could push it to the edge and then stop without killing us all. And the truth is it's not, it's not like that. They are psychotic. <laughs> they've, they've done such a great job of removing all the brakes. Okay? They've, they've bribed all the politicians, oh, sorry, uh, campaign donations, I think you call them, or consultancy fees, they've bribed all these politicians to stop 
them from putting the brakes on this problem. And they've all done such a great job of it, and they're all sitting around counting their money, and we're all on the same train. And they think somebody sometime is going to stop this, this problem. And the truth is they've done too good a job. There's nobody got the brakes. The EPA's got no teeth. You know, none of the environment protection agencies around the world have got any teeth for it. Yep. They've taken them away. So who's going to pay for it? We are. And the rich people don't realise it. The people who are making the money from this plastic, they don't see the problem as being their problem just yet. They're making money. And if they stop making money, then somebody else will make that money. And they can't, they can't abide that. They have to be making money. I mean, it's like these plastics companies have a legal responsibility to shareholders to maximize their profits, which means destroying the planet, right? Like we're stuck in this absurd capitalist death spiral to load the environment with more plastic because it enriches a couple of uh, people. Um, I think a very important thing to point out here is that exposure to plastic, like we're all surrounded by it indoors can, I think, vary, and I try to get at this in the book, that there's an equity side of this as well. Like if you live in a food desert and you only have access to, to preserved foods wrapped in single-use plastic and you don't have access to a farmer's market or something like that, uh, where you can go without plastic, um, I think we'll see in the coming years that like every other pollutant, basically, low-income people are exposed to more of it. Um, so even though, again, we're, we're all surrounded by it um, because we've been bamboozled, really, by the plastics industry, people will suffer more, especially in these developing countries that are burning our plastic waste to get rid of it. It's, it's unjust and it's, it's psychopathic. It really is. But nobody's free. So, like, nobody, there is nowhere that is plastic free in the world so far. We've looked absolutely everywhere we can think of. Like, it's in Antarctica, it's in the Arctic, it's in the bottom of the... Mariana Trench, it's at the top of Mount Everest. Like, you know, we haven't found anywhere where we've gone, way, we've not found any micro nanoplastics because there isn't anywhere. Um, so everybody is breathing it in, absolutely everybody, from the richest people to the poorest people in the world. And what you're breathing in or what you're ingesting in your food um, doesn't necessarily come from you or your neighbours or your local area. So... If you think about it from an atmospheric transport point of view and you think of something that's a lot heavier and a lot larger, like Saharan desert sand, so you know when you've got a big uh, sandstorm that happens, there's large swaths of America and Europe that get covered in orange dust, which comes out of the um, Saharan desert. So if you have a really big storm, some of these dust particles that are twice as heavy as plastic go around the world in up to 13 days. Like, this is fast, right? It, it's not like it's going to take weeks or months to get to you. It's literally whee, in 13 days. Plastic moves as fast, if not faster. It's smaller and it's more ubiquitous. So the plastic that you are currently breathing in your house and when you walk outside your front door doesn't necessarily come from your local area, but can, can come from the other side of the world quite easily. And so the control and the mitigation, the management of this problem isn't just a local thing. It's a global thing because even if you manage what you're doing really well right where you are, you're still being affected by everybody else in the world in the way that they're managing this. This isn't something you can compartmentalise or put in a box because the world's a globe and we all deal with the pollution that everybody else is creating. And with plastic pollution, that's seriously true. There's no borders in nature. Here's a thought of experiment as well. Um, a fish ingests a microplastic and poops it out, and then it moves to the ocean and takes to the atmosphere, and then you inhale it. Not impossible. I'll take it one step further and say we put biosolids onto farmland. Yep. And biosolids, the, the wastewater treatment plants are very good at catching the plastic that comes through. They catch like 95%. But it goes into the biosolids, which we then put onto the field, which dries out and gets blown around by the wind. So there is a very good chance that you're inhaling plastic that was in poop yep. just a couple of weeks ago. Yep. And, and also because it's biosolids going onto an agricultural field, it's they're being used to create food. So you're probably ingesting it too. 
That is something to think about, isn't it? (laughs) Whether you have a choice in the matter or not, you're actively participating in both perpetrating the problem as well as consuming all aspects of the problem in in its extant state at, at current juncture. So here's the next question, which is, what are the do's and don'ts around plastics in our everyday lives? Where can we reduce it? What do we do with the plastic that we're already brought in to our homes, into our lives that we, you know, kind of give to our children and to our pets? And it's in everything. I know my dog chews on toys that has a plastic heart at the core of it um, that squeaks. So what do we do? Where do we start? And, and where are the do's and don'ts that I need to adhere to on a daily basis? Matt, we'll let you start on that with your Yeah, I guess we could probably say first and foremost, do not under any circumstances prepare hot liquids in plastic bottles, um, especially true for baby formula. A lot of people are, are mixing that in plastic uh, under very warm temperature, and that's the perfect thing um, in addition to UV bombardment that breaks apart these plastics into micro and nanoplastics. Babies are drinking a tremendous amount of microplastic at the moment. Um I think like vacuuming would be great for, for your home to get the stuff that has settled on the ground. The microfibers just coming off of our clothes. Um, I have a microfiber filter on my washing machine, but brings me to the point that this is not an us problem. And I, I would like for people to do what they can and like reduce their exposure, but we can't lose sight of this as a, a systemic issue. Like we need washing machine manufacturers to put these filters on every machine coming off the line um like going forward immediately france is doing this by 2025 uh we just don't have that in the united states and that means a tremendous amount of these fibers are flushing out to the ocean or being applied to sludge and then to our crops um so there I, there are individual things to do and don't but i just want to make it very clear that this is not an individual like your yoga pants didn't destroy the planet right this is the plastic industry that has done so that is the end of my personal responsibility rant Having said that, if you can get cotton yoga plants, go for it rather than plastic ones. Yeah, I think you've probably hit the nail on the head there with uh, whose responsibility this is. And it does come down to socioeconomics as well. There's a lot of people out there that can't afford to buy good quality cotton clothing, so they're buying plastic because it's cheap and they're going to go through a lot of it. But they're also the same people that can't afford to buy the external filters for their washing machines or the guppies or whatever. And really, it it isn't their fault. They shouldn't be responsible for buying this. It's got to go back to the producers of the plastic. It's got to go back to the manufacturers of the washing machines. And that means that we need legislation. We need to force the governments to do the right thing. And they're they're very difficult to deal with because we can't bribe them. All we can do is bribe them with the fact that if you don't do the right thing, I won't vote for you or I'll protest you. I'll stand outside your office and yell at you until you do the right thing. And we, we don't want to encourage anybody to do anything too extreme. But peaceful protest is your right. It's your duty, I think, to do this. Because it's not just you. It's your kids and their kids. And, you know, if last century was the century where we made people's lives easier with building washing machines and things like that, I think this century will be the generation of the stupid people. Using plastic gloves to save your hands from getting wet. I mean, it's got skin on it. I promise you it's watertight. You don't have to worry about it. Bugs won't get in through the plastic, not through your skin. You don't need the plastic. But those gloves are going to last a 1,000 years. Can we really justify using a pair of gloves once that are going to be a 1,000 years in in the landfill? We have to rethink about everything we do about plastic. And vacuum cleaning, yep, it will reduce the amount of dust. But you have to have a HEPA filter on the outlet. Otherwise, you are pumping out uh, 20 to 30 micron particles and below into the air that you're breathing. So, you know, if you're going to vacuum, open the windows. Put that plastic out in the environment. <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's some simple um, things just that, like as a, you know, I guess the, the 101 to plastic use in your home. So as, as both Steve and Matt were saying, um, having filters on uh on the air, so like putting a HEPA filter in your in your sitting room or in your kitchen while you're cooking to try and pull the particles out of the air, that's great. Um, having filters on the outlets of your um, washing machines and your tumble dryer, that's great too. 
However, you need to think about this in the bigger context. So it's all very well for you to have that. But where does the stuff that's on those filters go? Like, do you put that in the bin? Do you put that in the recycling? And if you do, how's the, the either the council or the local authority or whatever it is that is looking after the waste dealing with that? Like, is that just going into landfill? Are they going to burn it? Is it going to be part of the recycled material that gets stuck on a ship and then disappears off into the ether for somebody else to deal with? So we need to do the life cycle big picture thinking of, okay, if we're catching the plastic that we are creating on a local level, on an individual level, um, that's great, but... Where does it go? Like once it's past our control, where does it go? And we need to make sure that the people that are managing this um, and creating the systems to look after this material have actually thought all the way through. And that's one of those things you need to sort of push for in uh, regulation and legislation and your councils and in your government departments and things like this. Having said that, we have all got um, like plastic containers in our kitchens. We've got plastic mugs and things that we take our lunch into. Um, what you don't want to do is uh, not just the, the, the baby bottles um, and things like that, like Matt's talking about. You don't want to freeze in plastic containers. You don't want to put food in plastic containers into your microwave. You do not want to boil things in plastic containers um, because if you um, – if you freeze, if you put it in acid, if you put it in oil, if you expose it to a high temperature, then the, the large pieces of plastic that you have have very small microplastic and nanoplastic particles that come off the sides of them. And that goes into either the food or the drink that you're, you're consuming. Same goes for the chemicals that are either in the plastic or on the outside of the plastic. So as soon as you expose them to any of those conditions, that all leaches into what you're doing. So um, don't store your food and your beverages in your house in uh, plastic containers. Don't use it in a microwave. Don't use plastic containers in your oven if you can avoid it at all costs. Or the boil in the bag. Yes. How crazy is that? Yeah. Cooking food in a plastic bag. It's it's, it's a new, like it was a, a, what, a phase um, that went through yeah. the uh, the a la carte thing, you know, in, in the last decade or so. But um, no, <laughs> not a bad idea. <laughs> And what about, you know, things that don't feel like the obvious uh, choice where it looks like it's not plastic, but it is, in fact, um, for instance, coffee cups, you know, they're lined in plastic to ensure that the beverage is held within it um, to pre preserve the structural integrity of things. You have plastic additives to different materials that are out there. And even with our clothing, is are we compromising and letting go of athletic performance in order to have, um, you know, a certain level of plastic materials not being integrated into its into its construct. Um, so I would just love your responses in regards to if we are to go about systematically replacing plastic in different industry sectors, what are the alternatives available to us to replace plastic with? And where are the solutions? Because it's very easy to go into a spiral of doom and gloom, um, especially because I work primarily with corporations and they have a tendency to benefit from the opacities that exist that they perpetrate intentionally. And the part of the, the, the reasoning behind it is that they put something out that is half baked in its recourse, just enough to get some positive press out of it. And then the minute, you know, it hits the fan and people blow the whistle on how they've fallen short of the entire rollout and it's called greenwashing or purpose washing or whatever label you want to assign followed by washing, they then go ahead and do the next campaign. For instance, even something simple as sieving out all the ocean plastics to make yarn that becomes textile, that becomes garments. And even high-end labels are doing this and they're getting sustainable fashion awards for it, but it's not actually helping the context. In fact, it's actually exacerbating the problem set. So where does the education begin and how do we hold these organizations accountable? Because as you said, the governments are bribed and paid for by these large entities that have huge amounts of capital reserves to put behind their measures to stay as they are, to keep the status quo because they capitalistically benefit from it. So how do we break out of this vicious loop <laughs> that we have found ourselves in that so many of us are just passive victims in because we, as you say, as the individual and oftentimes the disenfranchised individual who's not even really part of the problem set and doesn't have the capacity to afford access into the, into the loop at all, um, how do we get those voices empowered? How do they break out of the system? It seems like impossible. So would love to hear some you know, silver linings and, and possible solutions from you guys. 
I mean, I think it's important to think of like macro plastics, like recycled sunglasses or whatever from reclaimed plastic. That's just pre microplastic, right? At some point, that is going to break down as a macro plastic into micro particles. Um, and one of the things that gets me is like roads made out of recycled plastic. You're just abrading it into microplastic. Um, I saw, I, I think as we maybe get more science to, the uh, emissions of these things like roads made out of plastic as as d said that you know paint on roads is made out of plastic um it, it's like trying to recycle radioactive waste like it's always going to be radioactive waste in whatever form it's in um and plenty of greenwashing going forward like there's i see a lot of like a microplastic free water bottle um with a straw that filters out microplastics. I don't know where that's coming from. Um, but at the end of the day, really, it's just about not using plastic to stop it. Like you should have a water bottle that's reusable for cold stuff. I have a one for, for hot stuff. It's made out of metal that I take to coffee shops. And I think with enough annoying people like me at the local coffee shop saying, Hey, can you fill this up instead of putting it into a, a cup that's made out of uh, a plastic lining, um, maybe we can get some more movement on this. But um, I think the big question, whenever we hear a corporation recycling plastic into something else, well, then what? What comes after that? And is it a lie? Because honestly, I'm seeing a lot more 20% um, recycled fibres in clothing in the shops. And I'm like, I don't believe it. I actually think it's a dead set lie. There's no way that in the last couple of years they've managed to suddenly recycle all these fibres. And honestly, looking at what plastics go into the ocean, if they're going to collect all that and make a fibre out of it, the last thing you want to do is put it next to the skin because Christ knows what's in there. I mean, all those chemicals, we don't, we don't even know what they've got in there, but we know they're toxic. We've seen the effects. So, no, recycled materials like that I think is a dangerous concept. What we need to think about is put a bit of logic on this. A paper cup can't hold water without plastic. You know, if, if you try and put hot coffee into a, a piece of typing paper, it's not going to last, right? And that's the logic behind this. A paper cup can't hold water. And with everything else you look at, if it's paper but it's some, somehow watertight, that means it's treated with something. And it's not going to be treated with something that's chemical free. It has to be a toxin. PFAs like uh, flame retardants are also using waterproofing for rainproof jackets and things like that. If it's waterproof, it's a plastic. When it comes to bioplastics and all those others, the biodegradables, they are not the future. I'm sorry, I would love them to be perfect. They're not. They just break down into particles that are too small for us to see or measure. Now, all you have to ask yourself is if it looks like plastic and it feels like plastic, it is a polymer and is a problem because biodegradable plastics have been shown to be as toxic and often more toxic than standard fossil fuel plastics. And that's a worry because we're getting told that, oh, no, it's okay, it's biodegradable plastic, it's compostable. And in truth, it's not. It has to go into an industrial composting situation to get the temperature high enough to even start it. And the industrial composters are saying, please stop putting these bags in the system. They're just bungs everything up and we have to go in and fish it out because they don't break down faster. Greenwashing. <clears throat> yeah, there's also the side uh, thought that um, if you are using like um, recycled clothing, like well, clothing made out of recycled materials and things like that, and the same goes with the recycled plastic in roads, um, when you recycle it, you either you add a lot more chemicals back into it to try and, try and create some more stability and more strength inside the plastic, or you're adding new plastic into the recycled plastic to increase its strength, or you're leaving it as it is and recycling it and using it the way that it is. But it's not the same. Um, it doesn't have the same structural chemical um, integrity and um, function as brand new plastic. Recycling is actually really expensive, so it's cheaper to make new plastic than it is to make recycled plastic. Um, and the recycled material breaks down faster than new material. So if you've been what you think of as um, an environmental citizen and gone and bought um, recycled plastic clothing or recycled plastic shoes, you've now got a piece of clothing that's quite close to your nose that's made out of something that breaks down faster than if it was a brand new piece of plastic. And you're breathing that in, right? So we kind of need to um, 
help, I don't know, disseminate the information to say that recycling is not the answer. We currently recycle globally somewhere between 5 and 9%. There are very few plastic polymers that are actually recyclable. We don't have the chemical process to be able to recycle them. When you do recycle them, there isn't a economic call and there isn't a... Um, uh, um, a financially viable um, material flow for what gets recycled because if you've recycled it, it cannot be used as food grade. So it's removed from that entire um, stream of, of products. Um, so there's only a few things you can actually turn recycled material into and the demand's not there. It's too expensive um, and it lands up uh, lasting uh, less, low, like a lower period of time, and it emits more micro and nanoplastic particles faster. So it kind of does all the wrong things for what we're asking plastic to do. Um, recycling is just, is just not the answer. And uh, there's a recent um, um, report, um, media output thing from, from Greenpeace that was coming out recently and basically said that that's great. Like, you know, recycling is uh, a useful tool and, and, you know, don't stop. Don't just start buying plastic and throwing it in the bin so it goes into landfill. But recycling is totally and utterly not our answer. It's not going to save the planet. It's not a magic bullet. In fact, it's such a small part of the circular economy of plastic that um, it's only really valid for things like the medical industry where we can start. We, we need a, um, an output to manage it. It's not appropriate for things like our single use. It's not appropriate for clothing. We just need to use different material. I have to actually pop off. I'm going to hand over the stage to Dan. But before I do so, there's two things I wanted to ask. One was what, did, what your thoughts were about converting plastic back into fuel, incinerating plastics, all the other solutions people have been proposing around which there have been numerous startups and efforts that have been funded. Um, and then the other thing is it is Halloween. So like, let's talk about what's scary right now, right? Um, apart from going dressed as a microplastic, uh, curious about what your thoughts were around consumption increases around event specific um, cultural phenomena, right? So whether it's Mardi Gras or Halloween or somebody's birthday, people tend to step up and buy a lot more disposable items or buy wigs that are made out of plastines. Um, so how do we discourage consumption around events that hawk cheaply made, poorly made plastic items um, and, and that just steps up, particularly during the season? But I'm going to let Dan take the floor on that. And there's a whole bunch of amazing questions in Q&A as well. So I will hand the stage over. All right. Thank you so much for joining us, Asher. Um, I'm happy to take over from here. And since she left off with a question, I'll just put that to the panelists to answer before I ask any of the amazing questions we have from our audience. Yeah, I'll, I'll just make it real quick. Like Halloween in particular here, I think we'll look back on this time in human history um, with astonishment that we were wrapping kids candy in a known toxic substance. And it was like, here you go, kids have fun um, with maladies later on in life. Um, I, I think maybe that's that's where I'm optimistic about the state of the science going forward is more studies that, sh that like make those links between specific chemicals in plastics and, and early death among, among people. Um, and hopefully that starts to turn the tide against plastic in these insane single use ways um, that we just need to get rid of. Cucumbers have skins now in the supermarket is it's mind boggling. Yeah. And just, just to interject, I know that there's a broader answer to that question, but there's also a great question from the audience that speaks to a couple of things that have been sort of mentioned before about how all the micro or macro plastics in our homes, like sunglasses, eventually turn into microplastics and how recycling isn't a great solution. So a hard question that I'm sure everybody has is what can we do with the plastic that we already own and have owned for years? Okay. Uh there's a couple of things that uh, something that Asher actually mentioned. Uh, turning plastics into fuel, it's not a good idea because of all the chemicals that we put into plastic in the first place. Mm. Um, when you try to burn it, you're going to release those chemicals into the atmosphere. Uh, it's yeah, it's it's one of the every every two months we have a new we've solved the plastic problem. Whether it's termites that eat the plastic if you put a bit of wood dust in the plastic. Okay, it kills the termites, but it's going to solve the plastic problem. We just have to put that into it, or it's a worm, or it's a something else. 
we found a new chemical reduction system every two months, and not one of them has ever made it into production. And I've checked back through the time and tried to find at least one of these miracles that's gone into full scale and none of them ever have. It's just not physically possible for a lot of it. It's not economically viable. and There's no money in it. So just why bother? Yeah. I get a pitch that- for 10 of those a day, minimum yeah. 10 of those a day in my inbox. Yeah. yeah. And the, the plastic that you've got in your homes, okay, so where you have the ability to swap them for something that's non-plastic, something that's natural, um, then go for it. Uh, it is obviously um, expensive. Um, and it's something that a lot of people don't have the financial capacity to do. But if you can do, the, the simple ways um, to start with is to change what you use in your cooking. So please don't cook on Teflon fans. Please don't put plastic in the microwave. Please don't put plastic in the freezer. If you can change that, that will make a difference. The products that you have, if you can recycle them, that's cool. If you can't, then uh, basically we're going to land up putting a lot of plastic now in landfill and then don't buy any more. Like we need to just kind of stop the cycle. There is an acknowledgement that every day that we exist is the most plastic we have ever had in the world and tomorrow will be more. The same goes with the microplastic and the nanoplastic. Every day that we live, we're at Guinness World Records of the amount of plastic we have in the environment, in the atmosphere, in our soil and in our bodies and things. So even if we stopped making plastic and using plastic right now, because of the plastic we've got in our environment, it's going to continue to break down. We're still going to get record-breaking numbers of microplastic and nanoplastic for a legacy period after we've stopped um, using all of the single-use sort of easy access stuff. So acknowledging what you've got, removing it from your environment if at all possible. Um, so like having babies crawl around on plastic carpets is just a, a horribly lethal idea. Um and understanding that things like BPA are not the only chemical and plastic that we need to be concerned about. There's an absolute raft of other things in there that aren't considered, aren't controlled, um, that we need to and be avoiding. Tested. And yeah, totally yeah. untested. And when they are tested, tend to be tested on males, even though they have like high estrogenic um, influences. So that's like another whole rant. <laughs> but um, but yeah, uh, if it's possible for you to recycle what you've got, go ahead and put it in the recycling box. But as we say, there's very little that's actually recyclable. So just removing it from your environment is kind of the way forward where possible. I think on the plus side, if you put it into your recycling, at least it puts it in the one place so that one day in the future, if there's a chance we can do something with it, it's all in one place. Yeah, we can go back and mine it. Unfortunately, a couple of weeks ago, somebody pointed out to me that uh, you're actually better off putting all your plastic waste into landfill because at least it's safe there. Whereas if you put it into your recycling, it might get shipped overseas to get burnt in the open. We are not advocating for you putting plastic in your landfill. However, the science behind it it is right. There's a black market involved with plastic waste where certain countries like the UK, where you have to have a certificate to say that your plastic was recycled into something new. And the council declares how much they've recycled based on these certificates. But the person writing the certificate doesn't have to prove they did it. So there's this, you know, they're just shipping all the plastic to, say, Turkey. And the guys are writing the certificate saying, yeah, sure, we recycled it, wink, wink. And then they just put it in a ditch and burn. Yeah, basically the moment it hits the ship and it leaves the country, it's considered recycled even if it hasn't been recycled. And this is one of those myths about recycling that goes around the world with the amount that's actually being recycled and why there is so little recycling going on. Wow. I just noticed a question in the chat there about how do we help people visualise the extent of the problem? Oh. <laughs> I think uh, the 9 billion tonnes we've made since the 30s or 40s of last century, half of that, more than half of that now, has been since 2002. That's the extent of the plastic jump. Now, some of us are old enough to remember before 2002 and life wasn't too bad. You know, we weren't dark ages and we didn't use a lot of plastic. Now, since 2002, the plastic industry has redoubled their efforts. They've, they've worked out that fracking makes cheap ethylene gas, makes cheap plastic. And, you know, they've just pushed forward and they're pushing plastic onto us. So, yeah. All right. Again, if you want to get rid of plastic out of your home, put it in the recycling. We can try and deal with it then later, mate. Right. Burning it at any stage is a bad idea. 
And what about silicone that's supposedly food grade? Um, do they have this, the silicone have the same issue shedding microplastics, the spatulas, Ziploc bags, all of that? That's a really good question. That's actually something we've started to look at just recently, just based on the chemicals in silicon. Um, it will be releasing particles because it's a material that will. Uh, it's the chemicals in it that worry me more than anything. And I would say at this stage, use a precautionary principle and say don't heat any plastic. That includes silicon. So I wouldn't cook with it either. I mean, it's particularly common with kids, right? Baby bottles, but also toys, teething toys, that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. They've got them in the mouths the whole time, which, yeah. yeah. Nice, warm, slightly acidic. It's, it's yeah, the perfect environment for transferring chemicals. There's a huge Yeah, and you, you, you do need to look past the BPA label. Um, so it, they, we have, like, lots of kids' stuff that's, like, BPA-free. Now, so that's great. Like, well done. We've got the BPA out. But what about everything else? BPP. Right. BPP. The replacements are often more toxic than, yeah. than yes. what they're. Yeah. But it's going to take us five years and, you know, $10 million to prove it. Yeah. Because the company that made it didn't have to prove it was safe. They just made it. Yeah. We don't get ingredients lists on plastic. So all the chemicals they use to create the plastic. So a lot of plastic uses a catalyst uh, to create what it is. So you don't have necessarily antimony, for example, in the plastic as part of its ingredient list, but it's used to, as a catalyst to create the plastic. So there's antimony in it residually because of the way that it was made and, and other metals and chemicals and other things. So um, we don't currently have any legal requirement or governmental requirement that says that you have to put the ingredients list of what's in the plastic. Plastic is just like, you know, uh, a catch-all phrase or, or identifier um, and doesn't have a list of chemicals that are in it um, at all. So there are so many types of different plastic out there, it's just not funny. Um, we tend to block put them into different types of plastics used for different things. But in reality, we're talking about um, genus and species level kind of diversity when it comes to plastic. It's, it's insane, the amount of different types we've got out there. And each one reacts in a slightly different way potentially. Um, so one of the things we can do is uh, to try and get regulators um, and people that make plastic to actually own up to what's in there, make it a legal requirement for them to tell us what's in the plastic. And that helps the process along with uh, the scientists, one, identifying the impact and two, identifying the uh, toxicology that's within all of these chemicals and all of these plastics. But similarly with, with clothing, putting some sort of labeling system, some sort of testing system on how much microfibers are released um, potentially, not that there's much hope for that happening on a regulatory level, um, but maybe if enough brands do it, who knows? And to stop the greenwashing on that. Somebody asked me about uh, some recycled material gloves they had, and I looked into it, and it turned out that uh, the person selling them said 20 25% was recycled. And I went back further, and who certified that? And the certification was that only 20% of the material that was recycled was actually from a, a recycled material. So it's like 5% of the thing was recycled, but it was called a recycled glove. That's greenwashing. And we wow. need to prevent it. We need to be a little more clear. Like the, yeah. the clarity and all of the information that gets given needs to be uh, non-scientifically jargoned um, and openly uh, accessible to everybody so we understand what we're dealing with. We're not just kind of blindly being given material. Definitely. And I mean, even yoga pants were brought up earlier and the first ad was for cotton yoga pants and they were 20% spandex. So yeah. yeah. A lot of that stuff. And on that note, we actually have to wrap up. This has been a really informative and robust discussion. I'm super, I'm super thankful for all of you for being here. Just a reminder to our attendees that Matt's book is available at Island Press for 30% off using promo code PPC. Thank you everyone for joining us and for sharing your thoughtful questions. If we didn't get to your question, we're so sorry. We had so many great questions, but we will try to answer as many of them as possible in our follow-up email going out. And thank you so much to our panelists once again for dedicating your time and expertise to sharing this information with our global audience. And uh, please save the date for our next webinar on Thursday, November 17th, 2022, titled Plastic-Free Presence, Mindful Gifting for Healthier Holidays. And if you haven't already, we invite you to join our global coalition. It is currently free to join as an individual business or nonprofit.
Connect with us on social media to learn more about our work. We will also be sending out a follow-up survey and appreciate your feedback to help us improve. Thanks again to everyone for joining. Thanks also to our Plastic Pollution Coalition member groups and partners who shared this webinar with their communities and networks. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar on November 17th. See you soon.